Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Jackson Crawford. I'm back on my Patreon-supported YouTube channel once again to talk about a specific rune letter and possibilities for its origin in other earlier alphabets. This is part of a whole series that begins with, uh, kind of begins actually with a three-part series called The History of the Alphabet with Dr. Luke Gordon. Continues with a video introducing some of the problems of the origin of runes and then starts going rune by rune more or less through the, the Elder Fudok Runic Alpha, the early stage of the Runic Alpha we know about. In this video, what I want to talk about is a pretty difficult one uh, that leaves a lot of, of, of uncertainty um, with, with even just a scratch at its surface. And that is the third rune in the Runic Alphabet called uh, Thorn or Thors, depending on which uh, of the Younger Futhark rune poems you're reading. And it stands for the th sound, right? The th sound of English, the first sound of words like Thor or think or thin. Let's take a look. Now it's not even particularly clear what the name of this rune letter might have been in the Elder Fudak period. Remember, once again, we don't have the names of the runes written down during that much earlier period. In the Old English rune poem, this letter is called Thorn, which means thorn. Whereas in the Old Icelandic and Old Norwegian rune poems, the Old Norse rune poems, it's called Thors. Now Thors is a generally negative name for a Jotun, right, a so-called giant, one of the greater supernatural beings that are the gods' enemies and often their parents and lovers. And then in uh, what Alcuin lists as the names of the Gothic letters, the equivalent Gothic letter is given with the name Thith, which any particular meaning for uh, uh, eludes us. So there's something going on here where either the letter had multiple names in antiquity or the original name has been replaced in uh, at least two of, of these three sources. Um, if the original name is Thorn, then in Proto-Germanic we would expect that to be Thornaz, but people usually assume that the original name was the Old Norse name Thors, and so they give the Proto-Germanic Thorisaz. I think part of the idea behind assuming that that is the original name is that it would be more likely that a name associated with the pagan mythology would be replaced by something every day like a thorn than vice versa. I don't totally know if I buy that given that there's also a rune named Os or Ansus in Proto-Germanic which is a pagan god and in fact there's one named Tyr in Old Norse or Tiwaz in Proto-Germanic which is either a name for god in general or the specific name of the one-handed god Tyr. So I don't know if you can particularly make a call as to which one of those is older. If either is older, they might both be replacements for an older name. Now, the sound th, the interdental fricative, is pretty rare in the world's languages, right? If you look at uh, just people who learn English as a second language, this is often a sound that they struggle with, right? So. You find the sound in English, for example, you find it in Icelandic, where it's still written with the letter thorn. By the way, note that in Icelandic, or in the Roman alphabet context of Old Norse, this letter is called thorn because the Norse learned to write in the Roman alphabet from the English. And so, as they learned the letter names for the Roman alphabet, right, the A, B, C, D, E, they learned this with the, the Old English name thorn. Uh, it's also, of course, in like Castilian Spanish, uh, where it's spelled with a C, um, a few other languages here and there, but it's not a very common sound in the world's languages. Now, I also can't think, in particular, of any, gosh, that wind is blowing hard, of any ancient Mediterranean language that had the sound. The Greek letter theta was, in fact, in ancient Greek, theta, right? It was actually an aspirated T that was indicated by that. 
Now, in later Greek, that aspirated T becomes a th, an adrenal fricative, but it was not in ancient Greek. So we can't seek the source uh, there, at least not in the sense that it was the same sound. Um, but a relationship with delta is certainly not impossible if we're looking at our Greek letters. Uh, Richard Morris pointed out that in some early Elder Fruther conscriptions, the thorn nearly is a delta, right? It looks uh, like a delta that's sort of rotated a little bit with the the, uh, the flat edge on the on the left side rather than on the bottom side, or I ought to say, pointed toward the direction that reading starts in because a lot of Elder Fruther conscriptions read right to left. Uh, so, for example, on uh, Fin One, on uh, Trollhattan, on uh, Skåne One, these are all medallions. Uh, all from around uh, the year 500 AD, uh, we see that delta-like thorn. Now, 500 AD is not particularly early in an elder through that context, um, but we have so relatively few elder through that inscriptions at the same time that there's nothing to say for certain that this isn't a, a more archaic form of the letter that looks more like a delta that survived in pockets to be attested in these, these couple medallions around, around 500. But there's also an unusual mirrored form, uh, which looks a little bit like a Greek letter phi on uh, the Ilru Odal shield grips two and three. Notice also that the shield grips have a mirrored form for wunio, uh, the uh, P-like letter for the W sound, uh, making it look kind of like a mace. Now these Danish finds are pretty old from about 8200 and it's not impossible that these unusual mirrored forms were more widely distributed early on or are even the older forms. Now if these are the older forms of letters that would open up the possibility that th thorn, I'm just going to call it thorn because I'm used to that from calling it in the Roman alphabet in, in Old Norse or Icelandic it could open up the possibility that thorn is from phi. Now, not that phi has a sound that's particularly like uh, th, the internal fricative. In fact, in ancient Greek, the letter phi also wasn't an F sound. It was an aspirated P sound. It was P, right? Um, but one uh, noticeable phenomenon when alphabets are borrowed uh, by speakers of new languages in the ancient world is that the sort of leftover letters they don't have a use for wind up being assigned to new sounds that weren't present in the donating language either. So it wouldn't be impossible for someone borrowing the Greek alphabet or someone else's adaptation of the Greek alphabet to inherit the full set of letters, not really know what to do with phi, and use it to write a new sound that wasn't in the donating language either. Um, that's not certainly not an impossible situation. But it's also interesting to note uh, on the delta side of things, uh, Karina Salomon points to a communic inscription. So that's one of these ancient Alpine uh, languages written in a variation of the Etruscan mediated Greek alphabet, uh, that there is a, uh, an inscription where the letter delta is shaped just like a thorn. So potentially it's from a, a delta, potentially it's from a phi, if it is from a delta, that would make some more sense phonologically, given that d and th are both made in about the same part of the mouth. They are recognizably sort of related. In fact, uh, you may notice that when uh, the interdental fricative that in Old Norse is written as eth, which is the voiced interdental fricative, um, is represented in the modern Scandinavian languages, it gets written as a d. That's why we get through Danish modern English Odin rather than the Old Norse pronunciation Odin with the interdental fricative. The sounds are somewhat related, at least in terms of where they're pronounced in the mouth, they are so-called homorganic. So it's not a uh, completely uh, absurd idea that that's where the, uh, the thorn comes from. Of course there is a letter D also in the Elder Futhark. Uh, probably for the most part it actually represented the voiced interdental fricative and that is uh, the Dagas letter, Dagar in uh, what would it be in Old Norse, Dai in Old English. Now that letter could also potentially be from a delta, uh, two deltas kissing one another uh, is one way people have, have, have seen that being derived. 
But I think there's a different origin for that letter that we'll come back to when I look at that closer to the end of the alphabet. So a lot of questions here, as usual, more questions than answers, but hopefully I have at least pointed you toward some of the whys and hows of these questions, if nothing else. For now, from a windy old barn in beautiful Colorado, wishing you all the best.